Uh, welcome everyone. It's been great to see you again after a long time. Sorry for that. We just were waiting for uh, some update from Visa, which just came a couple months ago. And we get an access to that so we can start reviewing uh, Visa. Uh, a lot of things happened this time also that people submitting questions on the uh, WhatsApp group, which is great, because this way I know, guys, if you have a different, specific question, we can answer it. The second thing, Dr. Tania, she has an excellent case or teaching case about cardiac disease. She wants to present it, but unfortunately, she had an emergency case today. She cannot join us. Hopefully, she will join us next week. Uh, it's a great honor to have two great experts with us here today. We have Dr. Hopala. He's a chairman and well-known Baskar consultant uh, in the Middle East. He, uh, he is with us here today. And also, we have Dr. Omar Faru, who is well known from all of you guys. Uh, I see Dr. Ayn has from Syria also. He's with us here. So, guys, yeah, I'd like you to take this opportunity to ask him a question, you know. So, I'm going to start with informal things because I have this great, you know, uh, consultant with us and this benefit from their experience. So, instead of starting with a review of visa, I'm going to go through the question being asked on the group and then I'll give you a time for you to ask any specific question to any of these you know speakers. If you know more questions then maybe we can start with I think it'll be better this way. So let me go through the first question was on the group which is was from Dr. Abdul Hamid Okda and the question was that uh, let me look at here so. All right, symptomatic ischia, uh, regarding your experience in symptomatic cranial ICA stenosis associated with significant intracranial MCA segment, segmental st segment stenosis. It's a very important question. Like you have patients with extracranial severe ICA stenosis with intracranial ICA stenosis. So what do you do? And patient is symptomatic. So what the best match? And this is a very common question. I have one case like that. I'll tell you what my experience, but I'll wait uh, if anybody wants to start. Yes, uh, it's, Omar, it's what do you good, think, Omar? It's a very good question. It's a clinical situation that we see. Um, you get extra, extra uh, cranial ICA stenosis with intracranial ICA stenosis. We are trained as vascular surgeon to reach the limit of the skull. Anything inside the skull, we shouldn't do it alone. We should be multidisciplinary. So whenever I get intracranial stenosis, I get multidisciplinary team and mainly with um, a vascular intervention radiologist with intracranial interest. And I have learned a lot from them. Sometimes the most significant lesion is the intracranial lesion. And this uh, need to be tackled either in the same time with the extracranial or after the extracranial has been solved, but the patient will know that the maximum benefit will get after the intracranial. So each lesion should be treated on its own merit. If I have a combined lesion, I will get multidisciplinary team with me. And in that case, it is case by case decision making. And I have seen multiple variety in this situation. And, and this is my experience in that. Thank you. Thank you. Al or Ali, you want to add something? Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Samer. Good look. Uh, Professor Omar, Professor Kabbalah. Uh, these are tandem lesions, as we know. Uh, they are called tandem lesions when you have one extracranial and one intracranial lesion. Uh, usually they are about 0.51%. This is what I remember uh, from our uh, literature. Um, usually we, we resolve the extracranial lesion, and this is important, but uh, for what for that in the intracranial lesion, I think the collaboration with neuroradiologists it is uh, beneficial in this case, and you have to resolve it if you can. It's better, of course. This is can be made by uh, stenting uh, 
using their uh, their uh, methods to to do that. So uh, as Dr. Omar, uh, Professor Omar said, it's a multidisciplinary uh, effort. Yeah, thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you again, uh, Samir, for a, uh, putting together this uh, very nice uh, uh, review session. Uh, as mentioned, uh, these tandem lesions, intracranial pathology, we tend to see them in the forms of uh, either stenosis or in the form of small intracranial aneurysms. And in a case of a symptomatic pathology that we think is coming from the extracranial carotid disease, uh, the teachings have been that if the pathology in the intracranial is uh, not very significant, you would tackle the extracranial pathology and deal with it and then leave that, leave the intracranial for another Time. So I would, my tendency, let's say I have someone who has some intracranial pathology of around less than 80% stenosis intracranial, uh, or a small 2 millimeter or 3 millimeter intracranial aneurysm. My tendency will be to do the carotid endarterectomy and leave the intracranial pathology alone. Now, certainly a multidisciplinary approach to discuss all this is, is very essential. But I would not, you know, try to do both at the same time or do something. I have a symptomatic carotid disease. I deal with it. And at the same time, I evaluate the intracranial. If it is less than 80% or something, then I most likely will not do anything. If it is very tight or something that's more significant, then you may you may do different things. But the, this is this would be my approach to things. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I'll tell you what my experience is, my case, because, you know, I, I just had to have one case all these years, you know. Patient came to me with about 90% stenosis extracranial, about 90% intracranial. So as you said, guys, I went for interventional radiology, discussed the case, you know, in, in the team meeting, you know. And my suggestion, as you said, to let me go and do carotid enterotomy, and then, guys, you go and tackle the intracranial. Uh, they told me no, they have a study, the intervention cardio radiology said no, they have a study which showed that even severe intracranial, they don't do any intervention, just medical management. You asked me just to go and do carotid uh, surgery and that's all. Even if severe, you want to leave it alone. So I did they, that and uh, did his surgery and patient did fine. A couple of days later, he had a stroke because intracranial thrombosed, you know, were severe stenosis. Uh, luckily, he recovered from that. Then I went to literature, and I was surprised to find what he said is correct. For some reason, they have a trial intervention radiology, which for intracranial stenosis, and this trial called, because I remember I read about it at that time, called some, pla some price or some price trial, and they compare all kinds of treatment for intracranial stenosis, and they found that there's no place for intervention, and they found the medical treatment as good as intervention because intervention has high risk of stroke. So they recommend even for severe stenosis intracranial just to treat it medically. Uh, in my case, it does not work, but this is the recommendations. So I think we have to take case by case. But the, for, for us, the most important to, uh, to first to address the extracranial stenosis. I agree with everyone. We have to address and forget about the intracranial or talk to interventional radiology. But this is what I got experience from my, you know, when I talk to them. And I think most of them now, they don't touch it, you know. I yeah, I would, I would comment on that, Samir. I totally agree. I mean, that's why I said if there's less than 80%, ignore it. But if there's more than 80%, like yours, 90%, there is also a uh, potential thoughts of, first of all, when you do it, you make sure that you have the patient shunted so that you have good flow while you are doing the procedure. And the second thing is you really have to consider that post-operatively you either have to uh, anticoagulate or dual antiplatelet therapy post-op to prevent that uh, that uh, thrombosis event that ha happened. But I, I totally agree with you. That's why if, if you have severe intracranial disease, then medical management for that and just stick with the external. Thank you. Okay. Let me go to second questions. Here we have him. Management of symptomatic ICS stenosis. The, the point, Samir, the point, the point. 
Go ahead, Ali. Go ahead. We're listening. Uh, uh, sorry, Sam. The point, as me- the point, as mentioned, Professor Hubala, is to shanta when you, you do your carotid, I think. It is very, very important for our fellows to, to know that. It's important in this case to shunt and to use the uh, Javid or Pruitt shunt uh, during the uh, your operation. This is a point that you have to to put it in, uh, in evidence, I think. Well, let's, I mean, we are all of us, all of you guys, very expertise in karate. Well, let's talk about shunting because it's very controversial. Let me hear from each one how you do your karate. Do you shunt all the time? Do you selective? If selective, what kind of monitoring do you do for the brain? Uh, can Ali, what do you do, Ali? Or you shunt everyone? Do you do a local? Do you do general? Do you do nerve block? Because this is all... Okay, I have. I have to say I... I did many carotids in my career, so, and I used every, uh, everything, every uh, maneuver of, uh, of monitoring. Uh, oh, first no. of all, if you, if you uh, do it local regional, it is evident that there is no problem. You see, the, you control your uh, patient, and you shunt when it is possible. If it is general anesthesia, the only method that I, uh, uh, I get it that will work, I think. It's the black flow from the internal carotid when I clamp the comb on the external. I open the carotid artery, the internal, and I see uh, by my eye the back flow. Then I decide to, to shunt. It's empirical method, but uh, for me it is useful. I use it, and I use shunt only when I have a very slow and a very little back from from the internal carotid artery. After uh, uh, getting six, uh, 160 the uh, millimeter uh, mercury, the uh, peak systolic uh, the the pressure. So you raise you raise the pressure to more than one around 160. I raise the pressure to 160 at so least 160, and I put my clamps, I open the carotid, I see the back flow, and I decide to put the shunt or not. This is the only way that I think it's useful for me personally. It's empirical, but it's useful when I do uh, general anesthesia. A local anesthesia, local regional, I think there's no problem. You don't and measure It the- works with me. But you don't measure the stump pressure. Uh, I have, uh, uh, yeah, I have, uh, I have a work with stump pressure. We did it uh, many years ago. Uh, it is not, uh, it is not uh, so uh, confident to to see that stump pressure. Sometimes we have a, a high stump pressure, and the patient uh, wa- was uh, uh, having problem after surgery. And sometimes uh, we have, we had a low stump pressure. Uh, and the patient get well. So I think I don't I don't believe that the stump pressure transcranial doctor uh, the mm-hmm. EEG. I don't think that one of them can give me so yeah. confidence. Uh, uh, yeah. In, in in my opinion, uh, there are three uh, muscular surgeons, case. three types. One which is all oh, shunter, what do you think, all non shunter, or oh, so I use only the back flow. Uh, my what I do is a selective shunter. I rely on Omar, stump what? pressure. When it is below 50 millimeter mercury, I do shunt. And the reason I do that, there is complication with shunt. Shunt is not free of complication. And if I, if I get a patient which happened to have a stroke, which is a stump pressure was below 50 and I didn't shunt, I am in a medical legal problem. Um, I'm very eager to hear the opinion, Professor Hubballah, but this is my approach. Yes, that's a good question. Yes, I have experience of transcranial oximetry, transcranial EEG, uh, transcranial ultrasound, do you do an, transcranial any, uh, limited uh, MRI, monitoring or just operative. None of them, none of them is totally accurate. But what I really familiar with is transcranial oximetry, which is not an expensive machine, and the transcranial EEG, which is not expensive. You can push the expenses to be much higher, but you don't gain, um, uh, let us say, you don't gain less complication if, if you do that. But this is what I do. understanding so you do professor omar pco2 professor omar i think 
Go ahead, Ali. Professor Omar, I think uh, some pressure 50, uh, it's a high baseline. So for that reason, we don't have any problem. The, the study uh, that I did was about 30. I used about uh, you mean pressure about 30. Why so I rely perhaps uh, on transcranial assessment is, to brain your function? Baseline is uh, so high, so although you I don't have, have a good stump uh, pressure, this is your question. When uh, you use shunt or not to use shunt. Uh, Fifty. No, no, he's saying no, that. I, um, I well, was saying um, that you have. That's a good yeah. question. The, go, no, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. that's a good question. No, go ahead. That is your question. Sorry. Yeah. No, uh, some people I have the stump pressure of thirty. Some people, 50, some people have fifty. Some people have seventy. And there was a very so nice study that I have, I think, I've read yeah. about it. When you uh, are I with think the thirty, your um, literature if you have an about, intracranial about lesion on on the other side and circular Willis is not functioning very well. You might get a little bit of more stroke incidence. The one with 70 did show that it has a good result as 50. Uh, I follow the, let us say, United Kingdom uh, carotid enterotrectomy guideline, which is distributed to vascular surgeon all over UK. And we, we have, let us say, we have been obliged to follow the 50 millimeter mercury and we do it by uh, measurement with the with the uh, with the machine the anesthetic machine we just put the needle and measure the pressure if it is 50 you are right if you are 30 it can be sufficient especially if you have circle of willis which is good and the second part trans uh, the stump pressure does not mean that all the brain is functioning very well because the other side of the brain is like a closed box. The beauty of transcranial oximetry, it gives you assessment of both loops, the right and left loop. And it is, I think, in my opinion, are, are very, very beneficial to give this. You can, you can have very good result with 30 uh, and with good circle of Willis. I agree with that. But you might run into a risk uh, that if you are on the 50 side, Maybe you wouldn't see this much. This is my opinion. I I know a vascular surgeon. A vas uh, I know a neurologist in United Kingdom, in you know in my hospital, which was Silly Oak University Hospital. He was believing that if you do carotid endarterectomy within nine minutes, you wouldn't get a stroke. You don't need to shunt. You don't need to measure stump pressure. Yeah, he yeah, was yeah. like this for five years until he hit a stroke. Once he hit a stroke. He was uh, suspended from performing more procedures. So this is just a little bit of history. He was a little bit on the arrogant side. He was very quick. And there is a similar surgeon in Germany, which had the same style. If you do endarterectomy within nine minutes, you are safe without measuring stump pressure and without doing shunting. But they are wrong. And the time proves that they are wrong. Professor Bala. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's true. I think this is, uh, this is the argument behind virgin technique that you can do fa fast so you don't need chanting. This is how we people who do a virgin technique, they argue about that, yeah. Jamal, how do you do it, Jamal? Well, uh, I had the opportunity to do it in so many different ways. Uh, when I was at NYU, we used to do the most under uh, local regional anesthesia, so we were selective shunters. Uh, when I went to Iowa, we were selective shunters, but we were using EEG monitoring and transcranial EEG monitoring, and it was very efficient, and we did not have any major issues with uh, with that. The only issue was to, that you need to have the uh, EEG pro, uh, the EEG leads placed, and then you need to have the EG technician and connect it to the neurologist uh, and then they have to review it and you deal with it. Uh, then uh, when I came back to Lebanon, uh, it was a little bit of a difficult thing to uh, get the EG down to the uh, to the OR and uh, it was costly and took time and there was a lot of logistics. So I started to go with the routine shunting on everybody. Uh, so, currently, I do routine shunting on everybody. 
once you do routine chanting on everybody, you get used to it. it becomes straightforward and less likely to get flustered when you are doing it. And uh, when uh, you have sudden EEG changes, or the worst is if you are doing it under local regional anesthesia, and uh, when you clamp the patient, the patient may become super agitated and almost get off the table and try to put a shunt in that situation may end up being a little bit tricky. So currently, this is how I do it. Uh, I uh, uh, First of all, I don't go by pressure of 160 or 140. I ask, what is the patient's baseline blood pressure? If the patient's baseline blood pressure is 130, I always ask the anesthesiologist to, before I clamp, to bring up the blood pressure just about 10 to 15 to 20 millimeters more than the usual patient's blood pressure. And then I clamp and uh, place uh, place my shunt under controlled uh, uh, technique and uh, do routine patching. And I am not a nine-minute uh, carotid endarterectomy. I take my time. I have residents with me, so it takes a little bit longer. And uh, when you have the shunt, it is also a little bit more challenging sometimes to suture around the shunt, but that's how I do it. Now, if let's say I have very high carotid and it's going to be a problematic for some reason, and I think the shunt may be, I may have an issue with the shunt, this is where I have used uh, elective, you know, selective EG monitoring in the OR so that uh, I avoid putting the shunt uh, and I beef up the blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera, like what you have done. I'm curious on your technique of how you measure the, the, um, the, uh, uh, the back pressure. I, I have to tell you that I have friends in uh, in Florida that uh, use the technique used by Dr. Ali, which is eyeballing the back bleeding. But how do you tell this is good back bleeding and this is not very good back bleeding and this is enough or not yes, enough? That's a Certainly, good if you have a pulsating uh, I just tell the anesthetists to use the machine, back which is Dragger, and the and the dragger you say I have uh, can measure like the intra arterial pressure. So I pressure? tell him, can I please uh, 30, have the, 40, 50, uh, the I mean, pressure, uh, pressure you catheter? He has a pressure uh, catheter which is automatically calibrated. And this is how they measure the intra arterial blood pressure of radial artery and ulnar artery. And I connect it to a needle, which is a sm little bit smaller than the danger needle, but accurate in measurement. And we have two, two measurements that he do. One open to air, and he said inject the line, and open to air, he recorded this as open to air pressure. And then I put it in the internal carotid in a slanting way before I do the carotid endarterectomy, and then I will wait until the needle give me pressure measurement with systolic and diastolic waveform, and I get the maximum systolic, and this is the 50 millimeter mercury. It is done by the anesthetic machine, Yes, they are clamped. Yes. Yes, after clamp, yes, because... In... Yes. And, and, and when you do that, do you have, do you have the, the yes. common carotid and external yes. carotid clamped, or they are not clamped when you do that? Yes. Uh, because that's that's an important thing. Yeah. You yes. know, people are, because Mr. Fodi, I'm I'm not asking I'm I am i am mentioning that so that the 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 uh, fellows and junior faculty who are listening, they will know the technique because there are different ways. But it's very important that you have the common carotid clamp, the external carotid clamp, and some people put the needle in the common Absolutely. carotid. Uh, yes, and 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 that measures uh, the back so bleeding sense, coming from yeah. the internal. But you could argue that the stenosis may alter the actual pressure. But but these are there are various techniques, and uh, uh, yeah, obviously the consultant you have, the they have to realize this, the residents have to realize that you have to cross clamp the common carotid. Yes. you have to cross clamp the external carotid, and then put your needle either in the internal carotid in position and make sure you have a back flow. 
or 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 in the or in the uh, in absolutely the common right carotid, so because if I am measuring while open your, common carotid external carotid, carotid this is not a stump but pressure. Stump it pressure is the pressure in the internal carotid artery when it is supplied by circle of Willis on the other carotid territory, and this is a back pressure. The consultant that I worked with before me, he he didn't believe in stump pressure. He used to put his hand in the internal carotid artery. If it is pulsating. He said this is good, and then he proceeded with it, and he, he was good. Um, uh, his name is um, um, uh, is Magdi Obeid in Birmingham. He was a very good vascular surgeon, but he never believed in the measurement of stump pressure. But after that, we started to believe in stump pressure more than our fingers. So even if you get pulsating internal carotid artery after ligation, this does not mean that you have a good stump pressure. The only parameters that we use is uh, intra-arterial measurement using stump pressure. The question becomes more confusing if you are having the skills of carotid stenting and intracranial stenting. So you have four options uh, with tandem lesion, and then it will be a big dilemma. I have done, I think, around five intracranial angioplasty after I've done carotid endarterectomy, it has to be done under general anesthesia. And you don't cross a millimeter balloon of two millimeter balloon. You don't do oversizing. And it's risky. No, not in the same setting. No, on, on separate setting. Yes, on separate setting. Because when you're having a tandem lesion, we know that internal carotid artery doesn't have branches. So if you clear the 90% stenosis, and you have 90% intracranial tandem with no branches, you actually hemodynamically did not offer any benefit. And the, and and the same setting, you've done the, the same the setting? intervention neurologists, and they are very good. Yeah. They have very good mm -hmm. skills, and sometime between ourselves, we, we can manage what is the best we do. Uh, but uh, stenting, obviously, you have made situation sometime um, it's a lot better to do everyone separately, not to do both of them at the same time. Regarding what happened to Samir with his case, although he was unfortunate, uh, but uh, I would have done what he has done. I would have corrected the common carotid, the internal carotid artery extracranial. Observe what happened intracranial because this lesion can become more aggressive because you're hammering a lot of blood a lot of platelets. So if this was 70% stenosis, it will become 90% quickly within one month. And then he can stroke. So I think what he has done is right. I know the paper that he was describing, but this is, uh, let us say, um, not on the world authority agreement. So this is a little bit debatable. But what he has done, I think, is right, although it was an unfortunate for the patient. No. Well, uh, one of the best, okay, one of the best carotid courses in Germany is uh, the one by, um, which is a very, a very, um, very famous cardiologist. I can't remember his name, but he, he do in Frankfurt uh, a course. I mean, the problem uh, is that they have a, a strong trial, German, according to them. English, and they said very um, obviously Horace that Siebert. His name even is severe stenosis is treated medical. Horace Siebert so is I don't one know. of the best uh, to do intracranial but... intervention. And with a special technique, with a special training, although he is a cardiologist, not a neurologist, he has a beautiful result. And his opinion that intracranial lesion should be dealt with by a cardiologist and not intervention radiologists because in Egypt we have only 10 intervention radiologists but if you open to cardiologists because you need correct within six hours from the stroke this is the brain saving time or brain saving procedure so um, uh, I think this paper I, I have to go to see uh, how old it is and what tools they have used but nowadays if you have intracranial lesion it is even it is um, very high stenosis it is amenable to correction. Horace Sieber is the name. Yes. It's true. Yeah. Okay. I don't know, but this is a triangle.
Yes, you absolutely. cannot depend on one person's experience yeah. to get a conclusion. We, we say this is a trial, exactly and they showed very clearly that it's not an intracranial. Even so, we have to go with that. No, to, to to say, I'm talking about the junior well because they make it in the exam. So, in the exam, we this case to have these trials. You know, I don't know, but this is a trial. Junior staff, don't you need to go and read it and then. But it's not our field anyway. It's not our field, so we cannot. All right, so as you see, guys, there's a lot of controversy about the shunt, not shunt, uh, selective shunting. And this was, I tell you, tell you there is no difference, really. And because nobody showed the difference, because if there is a difference, then we have only one technique. But because different techniques, that means all of them, they work, you know. So so you can do, pick up what the, what the Professor Jamal said, what fit you, what you guys are going to see, multiple techniques. You pick up what's the best you think in your hand. But really, nobody can tell you my technique is better than the other technique. Shunt, all the shunt, temporary shunt, everyone has his own brawn and cones. Doesn't matter. So okay. this one, we always will leave it to the okay. physician okay. discretion to decide which way to go. But you have to have something. You have, if you decide not to shunt, then you have to do have something monitoring. But you cannot like don't shunt and don't monitor, you know. So uh, if you decide to shunt, then everyone, they don't need to monitor. But if you decide not to shunt, you have to have one way of monitoring, as a TCBO2, pressure, uh, stumble pressure, uh, EEG, anything. All of them, I think, the same. doesn't matter. depend what you look on. And remember that, in general, when you do selective shunting, you realize that only about 15% of the patients will ultimately require selective shunting. So that's why in almost 85%, of the uh, uh, of the patients, you will uh, you will have uh, no need for a shunt, and you can get away with either either technique. But the key is to identify those fifteen percent that will require shunting. And uh, if you have a good way of identifying it, excellent. If you don't, then you are likely to shunt eighty five percent unnecessarily. But you know you get used to it, and the, the life goes on. Thank you very much. The other indication for shunting, if I'm working with a fellow, because this way they can take their time, you know. So if the fellow scrub with me, I like to put a shunt. So be no rush. He can take his time. He can do his nice surgery. Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, the, we are all in, in in teaching institutions with fellows, and this is how, uh, whatever. I mean, but anyway, what other uh, questions do you have? You you make it you make it more difficult when uh, the shunt is uh, in the field for the fellow. This is correct. But, I think, yeah. But they have their time. They can dissect slowly. Suture takes their time with suturing. Yeah. That's a, that's a uh, very yes, tricky question. Not really, uh, but it's, yes, uh, make it a bit more difficult. Yeah. Do, you want, do you want me to All right, so on? second question, management of symptomatic ICS okay. stenosis with vertebral uh, artist disease. Like, yeah, vertebral um, artist stenosis and ICS artist, stenosis. The problem, the problem as in the question, I understand which one is symptomatic. Is a vertebral or ICS? But if you have both, you do them both and or... And this is a danger of vertebral artery, either that? by stenting or by... Uh, by any any way of surgical mean, which is vertebra is very difficult to get vertebral zone one uh, to get intervention. This is number one. If I have patient who is symptomatic, both internal carotid artery and vertebral artery, and not that the area of symptom, because he ha if he has, let's just say, amaurosis fugus, this is carotid territory. If he has um, hemiparesis, this is carotid territory. But he must have um, the, um, uh, let us say, the brain stem symptoms. And this brain stem symptom can be nystagmus, instability of gait. So let us say that the symptom is due to the two territory of them. I never treat them uh, on the same setting. I know cardiologists in the United States called Steve Rami. 
who do it in the same city, but he's arrogant. So what I do, I will discuss it with neurologist. These are the territory symptoms that he has. If I never seen it equal, it's either dominating carotid symptom or dominating vertebra. In my experience, which is limited, not far, uh, I have in, never seen it equal. So if he complain of, let us say, walking stability or or um, uh, the brain stem more symptom, I will treat his vertebral first. If he is having more carotid uh, symptom, I will treat his carotid first. And I never treat both of them on the same setting. And I always get intervention neurologists with me. I like them when they do the neurology exam before the decision of the procedure. And when they look to the MRI and they decide the ischemic area, which affect our decision making. Uh, we can do carotid vertebral both by stents and both by open. And this is will be my answer. And so it's a bit long. All right. I I can tell you the the teachings and the when I used to be in the oral boards in, in the US when you have combined uh, anterior and posterior circulation. Right. Our uh, typical approach was always to fix the anterior circulation first, see if the patient's symptoms go away. Uh, if they go away, excellent. If they don't go away, then consider doing the posterior circulation. I continue to do that. I will never do a combined anterior and posterior circulation procedure. I would just, uh, you know, it's how it's. If you have if you have symptoms uh, related to posterior circulation. But you also have the anterior circulation. Sometimes by fixing the anterior one, you will improve the flow through the circle of Willis, and you may get that uh, posterior circulation symptoms resolved. It's much easier, less less complex, less risky, and that will be my uh, my typical uh, approach. But uh, you know that's that, that's how that's how we have been doing it in the we did it in the US. Thank you. I agree with you, Jamal. I'll do the same. And this was a teaching, as you said, in the exam. Always use the external first, then you do the vertebral. Don't do it in the same time. The guidelines are clear at the same time. You know? uh, because vertebrate disease is not embolic. It's like low perfusion. So as Jamal said, when you fix the anterior, most of the time, maybe the posterior you know, symptoms may disappear or improve. But always start with the extracranial first. Right, Ali? I agree with you. We have, as Dr. Uh, Professor Omar said, that uh, Professor Hubala, these are two territories, one anterior, the other posterior. So uh, the surgery or treatment of the vertebral artery, and in some cases we see a stenosis of the basilar uh, arteries. I saw one uh, one year ago. Uh, I think fixing the, the carot internal carotid artery would be sufficient in these cases. So we do a little, a little, little, little number of uh, vertebral arteries, stenosis. Uh, question, next question is, what the measurement of acute stroke, immediate yeah. post uh, in the after, after Like you do a surgery, right? and they measure get a stroke. Yeah. I think this is a very common question. Yeah, it, yeah. Uh, I think if it I depends. OR, the question did not is where are you? Are you, are you still in the OR? Are you away. in the recovery? Are you in the floor? Because it's measured completely I usually different. do my own carotid duplex uh, scan. So depends where you are. Duplex to see uh, my sutures. Let me talk. Somebody else wants to talk. If anything happened, if I found uh, Omar, you want to say what you say? What do you do? Omar, you are in the OR. I have seen. And Bishan wake up with a stroke. Back to theater. Quick. The quickest way I can get the flow back again, the recovery will be much better. And the and tricky the part, when, the when I found that the carotid endarterectum is fine, but there was a bit of emboli that went into one of the intracranial branches, either M1, M2, or M3. Then I will call a neurointerventionist while I'm in OR. They usually have a 24-7 rota if you are doing carotid endarterectomy. 
And now the preferred tool is Penumbra. Usually they go with Penumbra because there is a contraindication for thrombolytic therapy post-operative. And with Penumbra, they can follow the artery uh, until they get the clot out or at least push it into less symptomatic part. And this is what I happen if I am an OR. If I'm in recovery, yes. If I'm in recovery, yes. Yes, I get ultrasound duplex uh, while patient is on table. And if everything is clear, uh, then the reason of the stroke is intracranial. Then I will get femoral sheath and quickly get an access and ask someone to get a neuro intervention quickly. Um, I have used the penumbra. Um, but, but the recovery, not in the at war, all right? to be done by vascular surgeon, always do it with intervention and if you are in experience the war, in the doing the ultrasound duplex clotic extraction. No, no, I, I get duplex scan, it gives you a very accurate information oh. about hematoma, about suture about leakage, about intracranial, I measure the peak systolic velocity. I know exactly my operation, how it went, uh, and that is why I do my carotid duplex scan. I just put an, uh, that's why I put an upside, upside on the carotid, I don't put goes, and then you can put the gel on the upside and you get a fantastic picture. Sometimes I can actually so if you're in the OR, stitches you don't go on with a new open, duplex machine, uh, vivid eye. You can count your stitches. This is how accurate it is. And then it will give you information till oh. internal carotid. If everything is fine, then you need to put a femoral cheese, get intervention radiologist, get the number of device, and go to get the clot out uh, if you are in the OR. Uh, Jamal, what do you do, Jamal? Same. You know, I think uh, uh, some important points have been made here is that what is the cause of the stroke? The cause of the stroke can be internal carotid thrombosis, especially if you have had a primary closure or if the plaque was uh, high up and you don't think that you, uh, you could tell from the from the surgery that what could be the causes sometimes. So it can be internal carotid thrombosis. It can be emboli. It can be also be intracranial bleeding or hemorrhage, or a or a or ambulance that happens. So it's very important to determine whether the carotid is open or not. If the I think I would go with a duplex immediately and get the vascular lab. I'm not as good as Dr. Omar in doing my own duplex, but I will get yeah. my vascular technician who's very good at doing it. I would look at it and make sure if it is open or not. If it is totally open, then my inclination will be to take the patient for CT scan and get a CT angio and get a better understanding of what's going on. Yeah. And according to that, at the same time, contact my neurointerventional radiologist for exactly what Tamar said, which would be to uh, put a catheter in and do a penumbra or depending on what the pathology is and uh, go with that. If it is an intracranial bleed, then it's a totally different situation. So uh, this is what I would, this is what I would uh, consider doing. Now right. I have to tell you that the teaching before used to be that immediately if you have a stroke, you take the patient direct to the operating Thank room, you. open and explore. Uh, but I think, uh, and, and this used to be the teaching at NYU and the teaching at other places. But, and, and you open up, and how do you evaluate? Do you have to open the patch? Do you have to listen with Doppler? Do you have to do an interoperative angiogram? So there are a lot of nuances of what to do when you, and then if you're going to open directly, you have to reintubate the patient, put the patient under general anesthesia, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of issues. That's why I'd like to determine if it is open or not open. If it is open, then I don't need to take the patient Absolutely. to the operating room. 
if it is closed from both, then definitely I might I have a technical problem. Sure. I open and extend my arteriotomy, do more endarterectomy, better patch, etc., etc. So, but these are my my current thoughts on how to address this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shimad. So just to summarize it to the fellow, the, so the first thing we do a duplex ultrasound. If it's negative, then CT scan throughout intracranial bleeding. If it's negative, then intervention uh, neurologist or embolectin. Correct? So this will be the fellow in the question, the exam. All right. Yes, and embolectomy by intervention radiology, uh, by, by, inter by an interventionist, not by us. No, no, no. Uh, uh, you should never, as vascular surgery, should never try to do an, an embolectomy. Don't you ever think of putting a, a, uh, a poverty catheter question. inside the internal carotid and try to do an embolectomy? <laughs> that would be the best way to have a disaster. So, uh, yes, you, get, you can get an interventional uh, uh, radiologist, cardiologist, neurologist, interventionist, neurosurgeon. We'll get their wire up. There are several techniques to get the, to get the clot out. Um, penumbra or other techniques and they they have to deal with it. I think there's a good question here. We face it a lot. Management of inadvertent insertion of central line in the common carotid artery. We've been called many times. They put a central Yeah, <laughs> what do you do? And, uh, it's a lot. I'm telling you, I see a lot of them, you know. So, let's see Ali. Ali, we didn't hear his voice. Ali, how do you do with that? They call you. Yeah. First of all, to have yeah. your uh, air pathways are uh, are free. This is to, to assure that. First of all, I think if the hematoma is increasing, then you have to explore it and put the stage on on the common artery. You still have central line there. Question. This is a good question. It's not the hematoma. Are, are you put a central line. Surgeon, when you the common artery instead of IG. Yeah. Central line is no hematoma. Ah, no, line there. See, I, if, uh, when you take it out? So do you take it out or not? This is a question. What do you do? They call you. The central line is there. Okay. And the so carotid. This? Do you take it? Do you leave it? No, please go ahead. Open, Ali. take it. How, how do you process that? Because it's happening. I, I, it's better to take it out in an uh, OR, I think. In operating room, I think. Okay. Yeah. What do you do, Omar? The theater. So... <laughs> Throw the common... Yes. Um, Number one, it's a very common request to get a vascular surgeon and you tell him that my CVP went into the common carotid. This is a common request. They usually so. Number one, what I do, I don't remove the caster. I ask for CT scan. CT scan, and I discuss with the CT scanner. I, I, I tell I him that, yeah, I need usually, uh, not just when five they, millimeter, they take it out, I need so one millimeter cut present. section okay. in the whole area to cover the where the puncture has happened. Well, what is it on? anterior wall, posterior wall, common carotid, external carotid, internal carotid, and I have seen all this variety. This is number one. If I, if I remove it and... Uh, and I, I don't have a femoral cheese with a covered stent in that area, then I wouldn't control it, especially if it is in a surgically difficult or inaccessible situation. Usually, the common carotid um, is an area which is accessible to us, but I have seen people doing it really very near to the, to the, to the thorax, to the chest is that to get a good control, you need to have a thoracotomy. So number one, I decide where the puncture has happened. This is number one. Number two, how to secure it. I prefer the endovascular option by transfemoral cheese. I get a covered stent exactly in the area which is, had been punctured. And usually I cover it by four centimeters. And then intraoperative, I remove the caster. And then by imaging, if there is bleeding, I will pull my cover distant. If it is in a surgically accessible situation, which let us say uh, zone two in the neck, common carotid, anterior wall, then I put him local anesthesia. I will open everything up. I know that I can control it with a couple of stitches and then I will remove it under vision. There was one case which I have used a closure device. 
uh, which we had a closure device at that time, uh, and it was very nice lesion in the common carotid artery anterior wall, and I was able to put the guide wire, take it and put the closure device, and then secure it from inside. But I did have a backup plan, with a cover distant if this didn't work. So this is what I do in the artificial cases. Secondly, you must mention everything you do in the notes because these cases will go to medical legal court and you must say exactly what you have done. When you have seen the patient, every move should be recorded. Number three, you should be honest to the patient because he will tell you, did the doctor put the caster wrong? Did the doctor done uh, rupture my artery did the doctor blah 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 you must be very because this is an ethical dilemma and the surgical skills dilemma and usually there will be an added cost as well so i've been involved with in in i would say a lot of these cases so this is my reply and eager to know professor Habballa and you samir what do you do What you do, Jamal? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, we, we've, we've been called on many of these as well. I think there are several things that uh, go into the consideration. First of all, is the patient intubated or not intubated? Many right. times the patient is already in the ICU, intubated with an endotracheal tube, and they're trying to put a neckline, and they put it in the, in the carotid artery. Second thing, is the patient receiving any anticoagulation or not? Sometimes those patients are have a PE, DVT, yeah. whatever, atrial fibrillation, and they are also on anticoagulation. If they are anticoagulated, you know, uh, I think that uh, the idea that uh, of uh, getting a CT angio is a very good idea because you will know better where you're going. But to be honest with you, most of the time, 95% of the time, the puncture is in zone two, and it's very rarely in zone one. Yani, yani, you really, and if you really um, cut down on it and follow the catheter, you will follow the catheter, keep going down until you get to the where the hole is and where this thing is going into the catheter, and you can dissect around it, etc. So I have not done the endovascular technique that you are describing of... Uh, going in the femoral and trying to get a sheath up or something like that uh, because I think that I'm not that comfortable with it and not that excited to put a stent graft in it. Uh, I have used that technique if I have someone who has had a subclavian line going to the subclavian catheter, uh, then I put a brachial catheter sheath in, introduce a balloon, introduce a wire, a balloon, pull the sheet, inflate the balloon, and wait and see what happens and have a covered scent ready for that. But for the carotid, no, I have not. Uh, also depends on the size of the sheet or the line. Sometimes you have patients that have had a cordis catheter, cordis sheet, that the one that you place to put a swan gans catheter, it's like a, a, a seven French or eight French sheet. That's something I don't feel comfortable. But if you have sometimes just one single lumen catheter, anteriorly, patient is not anticoagulated, etc. We've had patients where uh, we had removed it, the patient was fairly sick, but intubated, and with duplex compression on the puncture site, it was anteriorly and placed duplex compression on it, and it subsided and nothing happened. So I think you have to take all these into consideration, see what's best. I, what I don't want to do is to become the one who is to be blamed for the complication. So that's why I will not hesitate to take the patient to the operating room under local anesthesia, general anesthesia, do a good exploration, put a few stitches and come out. No need to make a complication twice. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that, that will be my, my typical approach to that. I would wonder what, uh, what Samir has been doing. 
Shukran Jamal. Uh, yeah, we saw a couple of cases, you know, and unfortunately, most of our cases was zone one was really low. But anyway, first thing is we depend, first, I think I agree with uh, Omar, is that we need to get a CT angiogram. Always do CT angiogram because you want to know how low. Because sometimes be surprised how high is a puncture and they go, I don't know how they do that, but they go really very low when they puncture. So this way, at least we know where, where is the entry side. And then it depends, you know, if the catheter is very small, as you said, it's like four French, you know, or five French, uh, usually you can put it and put a pressure, but sometimes if it's like low in zone one, we put like a balloon just in case something happens, at least we have a control on the bleeding. Uh, if it's in zone two, I just take it out or put a pressure. If any bleeding, as you said, we just make small uh, cut and we can fix it. If it's large sheath, as you said, uh, Jamal, if it's zone two, just make small cut and fix it. If it's zone one, then I'll put a cover stand there. I'll just make it ready. And then we pull the sheath and we deploy it right away. Because this is a big, no way it's going to, to heal. And you don't want to get, you know, as you say, you want to make it more complicated. So if the last, yeah. we do a primary stand, cover stand. Yeah, I agree with you. If there's zone one, I mean, that's, that's because yeah. zone one, I mean, that, it's an endovascular treatment, no matter what yeah, you that's do. That's a good I mean, question. This is the, this uh, is it's good been thing. answered by C put report, like which means only I have one case where it's through subclip and artery, and, and this one I do the closure device. Uh, non real emergency cases no. done at two and but three. But in carotid, I never so tried the closure device. All over United so, Kingdom, I know, and it's the only risky, one condition. But my question is that if they call the middle of the night, which is, is it safe to put patient heparin and deal with the next day, or you have to come middle of the night and do it? Because of risk of embolization. I think this is always a question in our mind. If he is like you call you to him in the morning, the patient has it, they found it. Stable, Can you put patient heparin and deal with it next day or to whether to come report, as soon as possible nice and take report, it out? I think it's about nine pages. Um, to avoid mistakes, I always, when I've been called at 2 and 3 a.m. in the morning, I always remember CPOD report. Is it really indicated to do it now or is better to do in the morning i usually resuscitate get little bit of blood platelets preparation tell patient till icu till doctor usually this talk will keep you until nine o'clock in the morning at nine o'clock then you can start unless you feel that you are losing the patient which i haven't seen with this with this type of injury so this is my answer I, yeah, I, I think it, there is definitely no question it's a foreign body, it's an injury to the intima, so um, a brain embolization cannot be excluded. While in my experience, I haven't seen it, usually the problem is bleeding rather than embolization to the brain, and usually these patients are anticoagulated, and if you go in quickly, you, you don't wait until you see embolization. Well, I haven't seen in my experience. The question is that, do you think there's any risk of embolization? This is the main question. If you think if you wait till the next day, is any risk of embolization to the brain and get like a TIA or something like that, or you think the risk is very low. And should would patient have And I, th I think I think the idea of uh, uh, these are good points and uh, challenging points. Uh, I agree with Samir and I agree with Omar that Dr. Omar, you know, uh, I wouldn't take someone in the middle of the night because of a line in the in the in the neck, but I would anticoagulate uh, because uh, I think it is thrombogenic catheter and clot can form around it, and then even removing it will become hazardous. So I think uh, I would uh, make all the necessary plans, get the CT angio, get the, get the studies, get the OR prepared, and do it electively in the morning, anticoagulate, and do it. That's what I would consider. Great, great. All right, guys, it's been an hour now. It was a very nice discussion. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate that. Because I took that opportunity today because we have a great, you know, experience, you know, consultant with us. So to go through all the questions.
Uh, any question from the attendee before we leave? Anyone has any questions? I mean, we're going to continue next week with Karatid. I mean, it will be a couple of weeks.